This is Rongo Rongo. It is an undeciphered writing system from Easter Island. If Rongo Rongo is confirmed to be a legitimate writing system, it would be one of only a handful of such writing systems in the world that were created completely from scratch without any influence from other cultures with writing to represent spoken language. If successfully translated, these documents could potentially provide insight into the mysteries surrounding the Easter Island statues and the reasons for their construction, as well as the civilization that lived on the island and the reasons for its eventual collapse. This is the story of Rongo Rongo. On January 2nd, 1864, Eugene Eroud found himself on a boat just offshore of Easter Island. Eroud was a novice Catholic missionary on a mission to evangelize the natives. On shore were a multitude of uncomfortable Rapa Nui, armed with lances. Understandable, since Peruvian slave traders had very recently dragged away over 1,000 islanders. The captain of the vessel suggested that they return home, and Eroud's Polynesian guide outright refused to go ashore. Not to be deterred so easily, Eroud requested to be left ashore. He was effectively abandoned on one of the most isolated places on Earth. Easter Island was rarely visited by outsiders, and the nearest inhabited island, Pitcairn, was over 1,000 miles away. Eroud became the first outsider to live on the island and spent the following nine months there. Once the natives determined him not to be a threat, Eroud was soon robbed of anything that he couldn't carry. Finally, when a schooner was sent to retrieve him, Eroud was completely naked. He had been dispossessed of even the shirt on his back. Eroud must have marveled at the great Moai statues, which all lay flat on the earth, having been pulled down by the natives. The people who had long ago built the statues were then, and still are, a mystery. In Eroud's time, the culture on the island seemed too materially and technologically impoverished to have manufactured the island's hundreds of giant statues. Eroud was not the first visitor to make notice of these moai. However, silently adorning the walls of the Rapa Nui huts was another mystery, something that no outsider had yet discovered. On the sides of these small shelters were hung tablets of wood covered with strange hieroglyphics. Writing. Unfortunately, Eroud did not take great interest in these inscriptions, and in all of his writing and correspondences, from then until his death, he makes only one mention of these curious hieroglyphics. Quote, In every hut, one finds wooden tablets or sticks, covered in several sorts of hieroglyphic characters. They are depictions of animals unknown on the island, which the natives draw with sharp stones. Each figure has its own name, but the scant attention that they pay to these tablets leads me to think that these characters, remnants of some primitive writing, are now for them a habitual practice which they keep without seeking its meaning." Unquote. Despite the scant attention paid to this discovery by Eroud, his testimony is important because today, Almost all of these tablets have been lost or destroyed. The corpus today of surviving wooden artifacts counts only 24 genuine inscriptions, most of whom are either very short or are so badly damaged so as to be nearly intelligible. Only in Arout's account do we find tablets so numerous that they can be found in every hut. To understand what happened to these inscriptions, we must consider the conditions on Easter Island at this time. Less than two years earlier, in 1862, slave traders from Peru had kidnapped a large proportion of the native population and enslaved them. Eyewitnesses told of how, quote, the raiders threw down on the ground gifts, 
which they thought likely to attract the inhabitants. And, when the islanders were on their knees, scrambling for them, tied their hands behind their backs, and carried them off to the waiting ship. The natives say that one thousand, in all, were so removed from the island, and, unfortunately, there were amongst them some of the principal men, including many of the most learned, and the last of the Ariki, or chiefs." Unquote. After international condemnation, Peru agreed to return the few who had survived enslavement. Of the more than 1,500 islanders captured, only a dozen would ever see their home again. Most of those enslaved died of tuberculosis, smallpox, and dysentery. One of the dozen individuals who returned to Easter Island brought smallpox with him. The ensuing epidemic proved to be equally catastrophic as the kidnappings had been. The island's population, that had once numbered in the thousands by 1877, had dwindled to only 111 persons. All Rapa Nui on Easter Island today trace their descent from this group of survivors. In the wake of this catastrophe, Catholic missionaries, like Araud, arrived and began professing Christianity to the remaining and vulnerable community. The native culture was condemned by these missionaries who found native beliefs to be heathenistic. During June 1869, the Bishop of Tahiti, Jowson, was stunned to be presented with a beautifully inscribed Rongo Rongo tablet by a newly converted Rapa Nui native. Encircled around the tablet was a long cord of human hair. It is possible that Hina Pute, the native who presented the gift, intended for it to represent literacy and great wisdom, qualities which were now associated with the Christian bishop. Jowson immediately wrote to the established Catholic mission on Easter Island, with instructions to investigate and obtain more tablets. However, now only four years after Arad's report, of tablets in every hut, few could be located. Arout himself could no longer be questioned, for he had already died the year before. What happened to the tablets? Of those that were left, many were being hidden or destroyed. Natives later claimed that they were instructed by missionaries to burn them. In contrast, the missionaries would later claim that it was only because of them that any were preserved at all. In any case, it is beyond doubt that many of the newly evangelized Rapa Nui must have been convinced of the demonic nature of their inscriptions. Natives who had once been pupils in Rongo Rongo schools now shunned these documents, fearing that any interaction with them might jeopardize their chance at salvation. This line of thinking likely led to the destruction of many tablets. When Jowson inquired as to the existence of additional tablets, the native who had gifted him a tablet replied that they were, at that very moment, feeding the cooking fires. Fortunately, many tablets survived this purge, because many Rapa Nui clung to their old beliefs and ancient taboos. They recognized the great mystical power, or mana, within the tablets. It's possible that selling or even showing their inscriptions to outsiders was considered taboo. Tablets were cleverly hidden in secret caves, which are numerous on the island. Regrettably, many individuals were so committed to the secrecy of their hiding spots that they passed away before ever revealing where they were hidden. Rapa Nui oral tradition is rife with such tales of lost inscriptions. Sadly, Due to the wet climate on Easter Island, the wooden artifacts soon rotted away. Indeed, as late as 1958, rotted remains of Rongo Rongo tablets were still being discovered in the dank caves. Some of today's remaining tablets bear the scars of water damage, likely from spending time in such a cache. The individuals that neither hid nor destroyed their tablets recycled them, Easter Island is conspicuous for being nearly totally devoid of trees. Wood was therefore in high demand, and the word itself came to acquire meanings of wealth and status. 
It therefore would have been sensible to make use out of these few remaining sources of wood. Many of the surviving tablets are carved from Toromiro wood, a species of tree once native to the island, which is now extinct. In 1887, a native was spotted using a long Rongo Rongo staff as a reel for his fishing line. One of the few tablets preserved today shows signs of once being built into a canoe. Today, evidence of a carpenter's handiwork is visible on the precious document, and large portions of text have been lost. Of the 24 remaining Rongo Rongo tablets, some, like the Aruku Karenga tablet seen here, are long and remarkably well preserved. On the other hand, some only comprise a glyph or two. The longest inscription, the Santiago Staff, consists of 2,320 glyphs. Of all Rongo Rongo artifacts known to exist, none remain on Easter Island, but lie in museums scattered across the world. However, there are a few more potential examples of Rongo Rongo. The Spanish Treaty of 1770 may have been signed using Rongo Rongo symbols. Furthermore, many of the petroglyphs on the island betray similarities to many Rongo Rongo glyphs. However, despite these similarities, no proper inscription has ever been found in an archaeological context. So what was Rongo Rongo, and how did it work? Rongo Rongo was almost exclusively inscribed into wood with shark's teeth. The unique curvature and organic appearance of the hieroglyphics can be explained by the demands of carving into wood. Close inspection of the material reveals that the figures were lightly incised first, like a sketch or a first draft, before being deeply engraved. If mistakes were made, then wood would simply be shaved away until the mistakes were removed. Rongo Rongo is read left to right, but turns upside down at the end of a line, wrapping up on top of itself. To continue to the next line, it is likely that the reader had to turn the document 180 degrees, which would have brought the next line of text right side up again. This reading direction might seem strange to us, but it actually has a few advantages. For example, each glyph is always found adjacent to its preceding and succeeding glyphs. This makes the text much easier to follow, if one doesn't mind rotating the tablet 180 degrees every now and then. The longest inscription, the Santiago Staff, is a stick about 4 feet, or 1.26 meters long. With this document, dropping down to the next line in our normal way would present a danger of skipping the proper line. With the Rapa Nui system, this is not an issue. When reading a Rongo Rongo tablet, one should start at the bottom left, read left to right, and the lines bottom to top. How is this known? There are many parallel passages or long strings of identical text repeated on different tablets that can only be found when using this reading direction. Such a fact would be an incredible coincidence if this reading direction turns out to be false. Why left to right opposed to right to left? or even a combination of the two. Sections of scrunched text, like this one, suggest that this is likely the end of a line, and not the beginning. Scribes are much more likely to run out of room at the end of a line, rather than its beginning. Also, these headed creatures tend to look more to the right than to the left. How many different glyphs are represented by our documents? No one can say, for there is still no sure way to distinguish glyphic fusions from distinct glyphs. This problem of distinguishing meaningful glyphic distinctions is by no means new to epigraphers of undeciphered writing systems. However, it is a particular problem in Rongo Rongo, where glyphic fusions are very common. Parallel strings of text show that scribes were often free to join or separate glyphs at will, an aspect which has stumped many investigators. 
What may have happened to the knowledge of writing on Easter Island? Whatever was known probably had been forgotten during the Peruvian raids of 1862. By the time that the first amateur anthropologists arrived, only a dim recollection of writing and literacy could be remembered. Two informants, who may have had knowledge of the script, were interviewed in 1873 and in 1886. However, some epigraphers today reject that either of the two knew anything about the script. Nevertheless, they are our only sources of information from individuals who may have had knowledge of how to read Rongo Rongo. In 1873, Bishop Jowson of Tahiti discovered a native who claimed to be learned in the script. This native was then an indentured servant on the island of Tahiti, named Mitoro Daua Ure. Although claiming to have enjoyed some training in Rongo Rongo, his comprehension seems to have been rudimentary at best. The bishop asked Mitoro to read a few tablets and transcribed what was sung. Unfortunately, Mitoro seems to have only been describing the glyphs, perhaps making up his interpretations on the spot. Here is an example. Mitoro reads the following lines as Kyore Henua Manurere. This translates as rat, land, flying bird, eating bird, eating. It arrives, the eating of the bird. This is a holy bird. Mitoro's reading continues like this, incoherent and nonsensical. For some of the glyphs, he is merely describing what they self-evidently are. For example, this one as a man, or this one as a bird, or this one as a turtle. However, some glyphs Mitoro consistently read with specific, abstract, and even obscure words. This consistency would have been difficult to fake if he were merely making it up on the spot. For example, he consistently reads this glyph as sky, this one as month, and this one as king. Whether this was a genuine recollection of Rongo Rongo instruction cannot be shown. In any case, Mitoro's catalog of signs, published over a hundred years ago, has not led to a better understanding of the tablets. Unfortunately, it appears that Mitoro did not fully grasp the correct reading order of the lines, as evidenced by his reading of one of the tablets backwards, from end to start. This lack of understanding cast doubt upon the accuracy of Mitoro's glyph identifications. Another informant, who may have had knowledge of the tablets, was interviewed in 1886. Ura Vaiko was said to have received some training in Rongo Rongo as a child. Unfortunately, he had been so well converted to Christianity that he refused to even look at a tablet, worrying that it might worsen his chances at salvation in heaven. When the investigator, William Thompson, pressed him for information, the old man refused point-blank. After more aggressive inquiries from Thompson, the elder Ura fled into the hills. However, the night before Thompson's scheduled departure, a violent storm erupted. Ura was then ambushed by Thompson and company in his hut where he had sought shelter from the storm. Ura was refused exit from his hut, but still stubbornly refused to examine any tablets. Quote, when he found escape impossible, he became sullen and refused to look at or touch a tablet. As a compromise, it was proposed that he should relate some of the ancient traditions. This was readily acceded to, because the opportunity of relating the legends to an interested audience did not often occur, and the positive pleasure to be derived from such an occasion could not be neglected. During the recital, certain stimulants that had been provided for such an emergency were produced and though not pressed upon our ancient friend, were kept prominently before him, until, as the night grew old and the narrator weary, he was included as the cup that cheers made its occasional rounds. A judicious indulgence in present comforts dispelled all fears in regard to the future state, and, at an auspicious moment, the photographs of the tablets owned by the bishop were produced for inspection. Old Uravaiko had never seen a photograph before, 
and was surprised to find how faithfully they reproduced the tablets which he had known in his youth. A tablet would have met with opposition, but no objection could be urged against a photograph, especially something possessed by the good bishop whom he had been instructed to reverence. The photographs were recognized immediately, and the appropriate legend related with fluency and without hesitation from beginning to end. Unquote. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like Ura was truly reading the tablets. He may have been reciting genuine songs that he remembered, but whether they corresponded to the tablets in front of him is unknown. Thompson did so much as to switch out the photographs midway during a recital, and found that the change was not noticed by Ura, who continued reciting the same chant. It was later learned that one of Ura's recitations was a Tahitian love song, something that certainly could not be inscribed on a Rongo Rongo tablet. So what did Ura's chants actually say? Even this is not clear. Between the inebriated informant and the language barrier between informant and transcriber, many mistakes are likely, and some are evident. These texts are nearly incomprehensible today, and the same was true when they were read to Rapa Nui informants a generation later. The chant, beginning with Timo te kakaha piki apai, is of particular interest. For example, in this line, we can plainly make out the name Tangaroa, who is the Polynesian ocean deity. What the line is actually saying is not clear. The following may be a word-for-word translation. Tangaroa, the good weather best lift breaking up if fall step best my fall step. This could translate as something like Tangaroa, the best bearer of calm seas breaks up if the best step falls my falling step. This, however, is speculative at best, and most of the rest of the chant is even less comprehensible. So, what do the tablets actually say? Much speculation has been made about the contents of the Rongo Rongo tablets. The only certain identification was made by Thomas Bartell. He noticed from careful study of the moon glyphs on this tablet that a lunar calendar is here inscribed. A comparison between the layout of lunar nights found in the tablet to that of the Rapa Nui lunar night names demonstrates beyond all doubt that this is, in fact, such a calendar. Despite all of this, none of the hieroglyphs can actually be read. Aside from this interesting example, little is known about the nature of what these documents are actually supposed to say. Informant evidence suggests that they may contain chants. Catherine Routledge and others recorded chants remembered by natives, some of which are claimed to have once been inscribed onto Rongo Rongo tablets. The best attested example is the chant beginning with the phrase Itimo te ako ako. This seems to have once been a popular song, for many different versions survive. The language of this chant is difficult and unusual, so much so that informants struggled to translate it. None of them could agree on what it actually meant. Quote, It was said that they were derived from one of the earliest tablets and were generally known. It was like the alphabet learned first. Uravaiko had stated that they were the great old words, all others being little ones. To get any sort of a translation was a difficult matter. To ask for it was much the same as for a stranger solemnly to inquire the meaning of some of our own old nursery rhymes, such as, Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle. Some words could be explained, others could not. The whole meaning was unknown. Unquote. Stephen Fisher attempted a reconstruction of the chant, using the rules of Polynesian rhyme metrics as a guide. Its translation is by no means certain. Nevertheless, if correct, then this chant, which may have been inscribed on a Rongo Rongo tablet, quote, is a vivid and ingenious jeering or taunting song, whose purpose is to entertain and teach the young Rongo Rongo males through rhetorically making merry with the young Nehru females, unquote. 
Fisher provides this English translation. Quote, To be formally sung is the chant. To be chanted is this. There's the tu'u. There's the frigate bird. There's the flapping booby. There's the tailless brooder. There's the four-footed bird. Doing what? Dwelling behind the shadows of people. Shadows of plants. Shadows of things. Lest Neva bite. Let there be dancing and singing. Stitching, softening. Let there ripen kava. That of the suns. Why the song devotion? Stay within the hole. Within the hole where? On the tea leaves for top tossing. When? So that there runs non-rain. Squirming rain. Filling rain. Put up a fight, young woman, lest the flower be tamed. Ha. Unquote. Despite many decades of study, scholars have yet to decipher the hieroglyphics or understand the civilization that created them. These symbols remain a tantalizing enigma, hinting at a lost culture and a forgotten history. Perhaps one day, the secrets of Rongo Rongo will be unlocked. For now, we will end with the words of Sebastian Engelert, imagining the mythical founder of the island, Hotumatua, reflecting upon the future fate of Rongo Rongo. Quote, Our Kohau Rongo Rongo are lost. Future events will destroy these sacred tablets, which we bring with us and those which we will make in our new land. Men of other races will guard a few that remain as priceless objects, and their Maori, or wise ones, will study them in vain without being able to read them. Our Kohau Motu Morango Rango will be lost forever. Awe, awe. Unquote. And as always, thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time.